Welcome to the show, Stephen Bardo. He is a college basketball analyst now. He played college hoops at Illinois. He was a second round pick in the 1990 NBA draft. He had stints in the NBA, including uh, the Mavericks, I believe, the Spurs and the Pistons. He also played overseas for 10 years. And after that, yeah, he became an analyst. He's the host of uh, Future Sportscasters Academy and Bardo's breakdown, and I got to say that his social medias are a college basketball fan's dream, and make sure you check him out. So, Stephen, how are you doing, and welcome to the show. I'm doing well, Matt. Thanks for that introduction. That was really nice. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, I would say you've kind of lived like every kid's dream. You know, he played D1 basketball. He made a Final Four. You played professionally for 10 years. I believe you finished with a championship in Japan. And then you've been an analyst basically ever since, if I'm correct there. Uh, so my question for you is, was it always the goal for you to become a, 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 an analyst uh, as a career once you were done hooping? Well, it's interesting, Matt, because uh, my, me and my sister, I have an older sister and older brother, and we all played sports. But one of the things we used to do off the court was – we would take things apart. And so I wanted to be an electrical engineer. I wanted to figure okay. out, you know, how radio stereos, that type of thing. And so I got all the way to thinking that I was going to be an engineer until I took chemistry in high school and okay. me and chemistry didn't get along. So sure. no, uh, I get I that. To, yeah. I had to go a different route. And, you know, my dad tells a story that um, we were watching sports and I told him, I said, you know, I'm going to really have a hard time being an engineer if I can't get this science thing down. And he said, well, you like to run your mouth and you like and you love sports. And he walked out of the room. So <laughs> I was a little bit like, man, what's he talking about? Like, I, I was I thought he was talking down to me, but he was actually saying, you know, you should probably consider sports broadcasting. And that's how I yeah. got into it. And the rest is history. The rest yeah. is history. Well, so, a lot of work in between, but, you know. I, oh, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to get here. Yeah, no, 100%. So, yeah, the start, uh, l let's break down some uh, Big Ten hoops here. Uh, my first question is, you've been attending mm -hmm. some uh, practices of Big Ten teams, you know, in this preseason. Uh, what are some things that have, like, jumped out to you so far going to these practices heading into the season? You know, I, I think there's not necessarily one or two things that really jump out at me. I think what I notice maybe from a Purdue team is that they have a lot of depth. Uh, they've got they've got some guys that can really score that aren't necessarily getting enough credit right now. I, I think that um, first, Caleb first and uh, Kaufman Wren, those two uh, bookend forwards around Zach Eady can really pose a lot of problems for opposing right. teams. Kalem first is shooting the three extremely well. Um, Kaufman Wren can post up as well as anybody in the big 10 that I've seen this early. And of course, Zach Eady is a all American. So yeah. um, if they can get some consistent backcourt play, which I think they can find uh, amongst the people that are there, um, I think they're going to be in good position. Uh, Iowa is the team that has a lot of guys can score. Yeah, uh, they've got a lot of versatility. Um, it's always a question with Iowa: can they defend? Illinois mm. has maybe the might have the most talented team on paper uh, in, in terms of Sky Clark being a five star out of high school uh, Kentucky commit. He looks really good. Uh, Matthew Mayer from Baylor looks really good. He wants to be the defensive yeah. player of the year. Uh, Terrence Shannon may be uh, he may end up being the best player in the conference. At some point, he's got that kind of potential. And I could go – I haven't even mentioned Coleman Hawkins, who's one of the better pro prospects in the league. Uh, so Illinois stacked. Michigan is exciting. Uh, Ohio State is young, but they've got some potential. So the league, mm -hmm. it may not be as – I think it might be a little bit more top-heavy this year uh, okay. than it's been in the past, but it's, it's still very competitive. Okay, so – yeah, my observation kind of looking at the roster saying to the season is I don't know if I see an elite team or a team that's going to be like great, like one or two seed. But the way I see it is the vast majority of the Big Ten is going to be competitive 
Like, there's not going to be a team where you can just kind of walk in, not have your A game, and then walk out of that arena with a victory. That's that's kind of the way I, I, I see things heading to the season. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Matt. I, I think that when you look across the board, there are a few teams that may struggle just because they lack bodies. Um, I know Minnesota is going to be without Jameson Battle to start the season, and they're a team that – they had 10 new players last year. They got eight new players this year. Mm. Uh, they lost Parker Fox, who was a Division II All-American. He tore his ACL. Uh, Isaiah Enan, I believe, is is injured or he's coming off injury again. So they've, okay. they've really been decimated with injuries. And so they will they may struggle uh, just because they don't have the bodies to compete um, yeah. early on. But pretty much everybody else, I think, is in a position to be very competitive uh, night in and night out. Yeah, you know, one other team I might want to lump in there is Northwestern. They got the the experienced guard play, but I just I, I worry about them down low without Pete Nance and uh, mm-hmm. and Taylor down low. Uh, I just think last year, you know, they they weren't really close to making the tournament last year, and losing those two isn't going to do them any favors in a in a Big Ten that's really heavy on big men. Yeah, I, I think Ryan Young and and Pete Nance. Oh, did Young, a really part good of me, job. part of me. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, they did a great job for Northwestern. And I mm-hmm. think, you know, I'm glad to see them have those opportunities in the ACC. And, you know, it's yeah. not like they went to shabby programs. I mean, Young's at Duke and <laughs> Nance at North Carolina. So I think they did well yeah. for themselves. Uh, and that's those are huge holes to fill. And so Northwestern is going to have to play a little bit differently. And I think that Robbie Barron, to me, is a key to their team. Uh, Audige and Boo Booey will score from the backcourt. They'll yeah, average, but... they, they could average easily 30 points per game, uh, you know, combined based on the fact that they, they need them to shoot that much. Uh, yeah. But I think Robbie Barron's a guy that's 6'9. He's had a lot of potential, uh, but he's just never put it together. I think this is a year that um, he's got the runway to kind of explore and expand his game. And if he can, I think that Northwestern can be a little bit more competitive than what, what most people think. Sure. And another observation I have just with the Big Ten overall is obviously 15 of the top 20 scores are gone from last season. Uh, you had, and this is rare for Big Ten basketball, is we had three top 10 picks last season of the Big Ten with Keegan Murray, Johnny Davis, and Jaden Ivey. So it just a bunch of new faces. Uh, do you have anybody that you could see as an individual kind of being that elite level talent this upcoming year? Individually, I, I'd say, you know, the, the usual suspects of Trace Jackson Davis of Indiana, uh, Hunter Dickinson, Michigan, uh, Zach Eady of Purdue. Um, you know, uh, I know I'm missing some veterans in there, but, oh, Cliff Omorie at uh, Rutgers. Yeah, Dante Scott and Hakeem Hart in Maryland, uh, Jaden Pick, uh, Jalen Pickett, and yep. Seth Lundy at Penn State. I mean, I, I can go through the conference like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but do you think like that that upper echelon of the guys I just named of those three players who are now you know first round picks? Do you think there's going to be anybody who could potentially make that jump to kind of reach the level of those three guys? I think that Jalen Hood Shafino. Um, could be a one and done prospect. I think he's got that kind of game, that body. Uh, he's got poise. He seems to just know. I just was watching uh, Indiana versus St. Francis, and uh, he looks very good, very like he's been there before. I could sure. see him having uh, a meteor, meteoric rise, so to speak. Um, I think there's a few other players that kind of could be under the radar. Um, I think Malik Renew, I, I, I think Jalen Hushafino is going to get a lot of eyeballs on him, but Malik Renew is is a guy that he's going to – I think he'll have a, a nice impact with Indiana and the Big Ten as well. So they have two there. Um, I mentioned Terrence Shannon and uh, Matthew Mayer at Illinois. I think they'll have the same effect. But, excuse me, Sky Clark is really poised. He's similar to Jalen Hood Shafino, in my opinion. I don't, he's not as big, but he's mm. very similar in the poise uh, and his feel for the game. I think Tony Perkins could be a breakout player for Iowa. Um, he's a tenacious guard that will get the 
he'll get a chance to score the rock with the uh, graduation of Bohannon. Yeah. Um, Chucky Hepburn and Tyler Wall are preseason uh, all Big Ten performers for Wisconsin. Don't be surprised to see one or both of those guys be in the 15 point, if not uh, more per game range. So there's several Agreed. suspects there that could have breakout years. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's hard to prognosticate just because, uh, you know, it's so early. But there is a kid, uh, Derek Simpson from Rutgers, who oh, will yeah. be a surprise. Point guard, uh, athletic is all get out. He'll be a surprise. Make sure you watch him as well. Sure. And, and you know, one guy, I, I, I before I say it, I'm impressed with that recall there. You just listed off like 10 plus players like it was nothing. So that, that was impressive. But okay, good, uh, good. Uh, <laughs> a guy who uh, a guy who enters my mind is a guy who I could see taking that big leap is uh, Chris Murray from Iowa. Oh, I, yeah. I, a, lot, a lot of people are saying they could see Keegan level, you know, a, a Keegan Murray level season. I don't know if I'll go that far, but I could definitely see Chris Murray taking a huge jump this upcoming year. I agree. And I, I, I was, uh, you know, remiss in leaving Chris out. Uh, He's, I think he's going to be a top three scorer in the, in the league. Um, yeah. I don't know that he'll have lead the nation in scoring uh, season like his uh, like Keegan, but Chris, I believe, is a a slightly better passer. Uh, I believe he's a better three point shooter when at, at the same time when they were in college. Uh, Keegan has obviously gotten he keeps he continues to get better because he's yeah. a he's a hard worker. Um, but Chris is going to have an outstanding year because. Think about this. Uh, Fran McCaffrey is one of the best talent evaluators in the Big Ten, in my opinion. And he also has a good – they do a good job of player development while there uh, because Joe Wieskamp is a pro. Uh, Luca Garza was overlooked by a lot of people. He was on the East Coast in D.C. And he, he can't, comes all the way to Iowa. Um, uh, Keegan Murray was 136th ranked in the country. And he's the number four pick in the NBA draft. So I, the Iowa Hawkeyes have a system, have a way of identifying talent. So Fran McCaffrey and his his staff, I wouldn't bet against them with the, the type of season that Chris Murray can have this season. And I got I got to hype you up one more time. That is great insight. And the reason I'm hyping you up is I'm, I'm a Big Ten hoops junkie, and I've been for years. And I talk to my buddies. I talk their ear off, and they get annoyed. But to see someone who knows way more than me is just so cool. So I, I appreciate this conversation we're having right now. Um, so let, let's let's dive into some storylines. Uh, are there any storylines heading into the season that you are intrigued by? Well, the, the first one was that uh, Wisconsin in certain polls was ranked preseason 10th. Yeah. And – you know, it's just like, what are y'all doing? Like, it, it, are you trying to do this in favor of Wisconsin? Do you all love the Badgers <laughs> so that you give them bulletin yeah. board material? You know, they're the only team in the conference, Matt, that has two preseason all Big Ten yep. performers, but they're 10th. Yeah. And they're, they, they've never been 10th. <laughs> as long as I've been around, uh, you know, they, they were they were about 10th when I was playing. Steve mm-hmm. Yoder days with Kirk Portman and Danny. Uh, Jones, uh, you know, those guys. And uh, Trent Jackson was an outstanding. Yeah. They had good teams, but the Big Ten was just loaded then. Um, mm. You know, uh, the 30. Final line, I. Well, Matt, consider this. In my junior and senior year alone, my last two years in the Big Ten, there were 31 first and second round NBA draft picks. Wow. Out, out of the Big <laughs> Ten alone. Uh, that's, that's intense. That, yeah, that's 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 talented up and down yeah. the league. So, you know, it was different then than it is now, but it's still very talented uh, today. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and you know, I, I mentioned it earlier where this past season was a bit of an outlier with yes. with having those three top ten uh, picks. That's not a normal thing, and I and I'm going to dive into that uh, with having three top ten picks in the Big Ten. Uh, it, it, it surprised me that not a single team made the Sweet Six went past the Sweet Sixteen this past year. Um, back-to-back years, the Big Ten has had the most uh, teams in the NCAA tournament, but they just haven't produced. Uh, what do you make of the 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 struggles these last two years of the Big Ten has had in the tournament? 
Well, Matt, you may, you bring up a great point, and it's something that the Big Ten has to address. I know that it's the elephant in the room with the conference whenever you talk about the drought of NCAA championships. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I've always questioned how can you call yourself the best league in the country if you don't perform the best in the most important time of the year? I mean, I Jim Beheim, the Syracuse head coach, recently said the Big Ten sucked in the tournament. And for Big Ten fans and a former Big Ten player and, you know, a guy that calls games and makes my living uh, covering the sport, it doesn't feel good to hear, but he's not wrong. And, you know, you go nine and nine uh, in the tournament, that's just not – it's not good enough. And so I think the teams now are starting to um, maybe address some of that because if you notice the athletes that have come into the conference recently – the three mm. aforementioned uh, lottery picks. You forgot to mention Malachi Branham. Yeah. Guard from Ohio State that went first round as well. Um, yeah, he's really Liddell old. Liddell went second round. And, you know, there was a there. it was a good amount of players that got drafted and got opportunities at the next level. So the, the Big Ten is trying to address that uh, with the type of athletes that they're getting in terms of a um, little bit more – lengthier athletes that can be more uh, multi-positional mm. and do things differently defensively, uh, not necessarily reliant on the big as much uh, as the Big Ten has been uh, have known to be. Um, so I think it's changing, uh, but they're going to have to have a breakthrough year. And I think the team, looking at the, the, the teams right now early on, uh, without having any regular season games under their belt, the team that looks to be that has the most potential to go deepest in the tournament right now to me is Illinois based on their roster. With, with, with the, the three wings of Meyer, Shannon and uh, Coleman, because yeah. those, those are lengthy athletes who, who I could see all three of them playing at the next level, especially Ty if Roger. Meyer. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, you know, yeah, that too. And, but if, especially if Meyer hits that goal of being defensive player of the year in the big 10, then Okay. Meyer is a problem. He, he, he's going to be the real deal because I remember two years ago and well, soon to be two years ago in the 2021 NCAA tournament when they played Wisconsin, Wisconsin actually played Baylor pretty tough, but yeah. Meyer, whenever they kind of came close, Meyer would just kept hitting daggers after daggers and they were not just spot up shots. I mean, he was going, taking a dribble or two, pulling up from 15 feet and just, you know, ripping the heart out from Badger Nation. So yeah, I'm, I'm really intrigued to see what Meyer can do kind of as more of a focal point with Illinois this upcoming season. Yeah, it's going to be fun to see. Uh, Ty Rogers is in that rotation. Uh, R.J. Melendez, unfortunately, Luke Goody, I believe, broke his foot uh, in an exhibition game, so he's going to be out for a while. But uh, they, um, Jaden Epps has had one of the better preseasons of any guard. The, the guard from Baltimore can really get downhill and score. Uh, I'm, I, they, they are deep, they're, um, multifaceted and those are the type of teams like a Houston, yeah. like, uh, Gonzaga, uh, like North Carolina that have this plethora of wings and interchangeable, uh, players that can play different styles. And I think Illinois is poised to have a deep run this year. Uh, if they can stay healthy and everybody accepts their roles. Yeah, no, going off of that. Illinois had two really talented teams in the 2021 season, the 21-22 season, especially that 2021 season where they had Desumu and Coburn down low. Um, and I, I, each year I thought that Illinois was a true Final Four contender, if not in 2021, a national title contender, and they didn't make it past round of 32. I mean, they have basically an entirely new uh, roster uh with a bunch of talented players coming in, what do they need to improve on to make it pass around a 32 to make that run to a potential final four? Well, it's so it's so early to say right now, Matt, and you're not going to really know this team's got to find their identity. When you have 10 new players, it mm. takes about, uh, it, it takes a good 10, 12 games before you even begin to know what you're looking at, what you have as a, as a unit. And so it's going to take a while and they've got some great challenges because they play UCLA uh, early, and that they're gonna they're gonna know really soon uh, what they're dealing with. I guess they had good reviews in the scrimmage against Kansas. They played; they were very pleased with what they saw. 
So, um, you know, they'll, they'll learn early, but it's going to take a while to figure out exactly what they're going to look like. And again, they're going to have to have some adversity and see how they respond because that that's, that's a key factor in any team's ability uh, to win six games or to win four games to get to a final four is sure. the ability to respond to adversity. So um, it's going to take a while, but um, you know, I, I think that we'll just have to see what this unit does. Can they, will they be able to hit enough threes, mm. you know, because on paper it looks like, well, they may not be the best three point shooting team, but we'll see, um, you know, when they start to play and get up and down and the lights come on. Yeah. And now kind of a team that's, the exact opposite of Illinois is Indiana. They return just about everybody, and there's some really high expectations heading into the season. And I see where people are coming from. But from my perspective, I, I see a lot of people picking them to win the Big Ten, and I don't know if I'm ready to go that far. Just because they kind of snuck into the tournament, and when they got to the tournament, they, they got blown out. Now they do, like you mentioned earlier, have some talented freshmen that might be able to help them reach that next level. But I don't know if I'm ready to say they'll be Big Ten tight, uh, champs because I would say Indiana, the last decade or so, or probably a little bit over a decade, they've every single year, I don't know if there's been a single year they didn't have talent. Just gelling together and meshing to play up to their potential has been the issue. Um, but under Mike Woodson, this is only a second year, so so we're going to see if he can kind of break that 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 streak of not – living up to potential last year. He did a good job making the NCAA tournament. Um, but what do you think about Indiana's expectations heading into the season? You think they're too high or do you think they're just right? No, I, I think that you referenced a quote earlier that was really spot on the, the big 10 lost 15 of their top 20 scores, you know, they're gone. Mm. And so there's a lot of uncertainty and what Indiana does bring back is certainty. Yeah. They in do certain positions and experience and, I think that when you look back on last season, you, you've got to you got to consider that Indiana beat Illinois, and I believe they they played it, Iowa in the championship game and lost. And so, when you play four games in four days, then you've got to go play in the first four, and they want they want a, a an, an exciting game in the first four, and then you've got to fly across country on the West Coast and play a, a refreshed, a rested, very good St. Mary's team, you're yeah. going to get blown out because you just, you're exhausted. And so I think that uh, they did a, they did a good job. The result didn't really, the, the ending didn't justify the effort that they put forth to get into the tournament. And, you know, sure. so I think that there needs to be some kudos given to them for that. Yeah. This they were year, tough. I, yeah. And I think this year they will have, Last year's experience under their belt. They have another full season of Big Ten play. Uh, they'll know they'll know themselves even better because uh, they're a much deeper team this year. They've got more size this season. They've got mm. more depth, and so I think you're going to see a team that you know is going to be they're, they'll be upper echelon of the Big Ten. I don't know that they'll win the conference, but they're going to be right there when it's all said and done. All right, all right. And then, uh, do you think Trace Jackson Davis as an individual has uh, a, there's a spot for him in the NBA next season. You know, Matt, it's hard to say because the league is so pace and space right now. Yeah. And they want bigs to shoot threes. They want, you know, they don't really want guys running into the lane uh, or running to the post area to clog the area up. So um, I, you know, if he can expand his game, I know Mike Woodson wants him to shoot threes. Uh I'm sure they have him working on that. I don't know how comfortable he can be at that, but I think his ability to play at the next level would be contingent upon how comfortable he can become playing on the perimeter, facing up, uh, being able to hit the catch and jump, catch and shoot shots, uh, maybe putting it on the deck once or twice on a dribble handoff, making a play and getting on the offensive rebound and just uh, playing hard. I think he can find a spot uh, doing those things, but he's going to have to expand his game a little bit more than what we've seen in Indiana thus far. Okay, no, that's a, that's a fair assessment. And um, so the next team, the the next team, starting with the uh, letter I, I want to talk about is Iowa. Um, the, yeah, we talked about it earlier. Chris Murray's coming back. Uh, 
they got both the McCaffrey's back and Patrick McCaffrey. I'm a fan of his game, you know, lengthy athletic guy. And then down low, uh, Philip Rebracca, I believe is how you say his name. I know he's 25 years. Rebracha, thank you very much. Uh, He's 25 years old. He's older than me. And so he's a solid serviceable guy down low. Uh, I I think Iowa kind of like Wisconsin, as you mentioned earlier, they're a team not to sleep on last season. I felt the exact same way as well, where, I looked at it and I said, okay, Iowa and Wisconsin, they shouldn't be this far down. I think both of them will be solid teams. And I feel the exact same way this year where both teams should not be slept on. Yeah, I think that they've got some um, – they've got a lot of depth that gets overlooked. You talk about the McCaffrey brothers. So Patrick was a, a 10 points per game scorer last year. Uh, he's stronger this year. Uh, he'll get – more space to expand his game with Keegan's absence. Uh, obviously, Chris Murray uh, is going, in my opinion, to be a 20-point scorer per game. Uh, he'll probably have about three or four assists a game and maybe close to double-digit rebound. He, he's going to have a monster season. Um, I also think uh, Tony Perkins is going to have a monster season. Tony Perkins could be a guy that he might bust out and have games of 25, 30 points against – certain opponents because he's that aggressive and he's going to have that kind of green light. So they've got a goon delay up front. Um, uh, Riley, I believe is the other big uh, with Robracha. Um, and so they, they've got a lot of options and, you know, they've got some experience with Connor McCaffrey coming back. <clears throat> and so, you know, Fran does a great job of putting his players in position to be successful offensively. And I don't think we'll see, you know, the Ulysses in the backcourt, forgot to mention him. He'll be a nice security blanket as well. Uh, So I think the Iowa Hawkeyes will be, they're not going to sneak up on anybody in the conference. Maybe the the, the fans may not expect them to have high expectations, but uh, the the coaches in the conference understand how deep and talented this, this team is. Sure. And talking about talented teams, Michigan obviously brings in a ton of talent. (laughs) They return Hunter Dickinson. Um, what do, you, what do you think about that that mesh kind of with the returning Hunter Dickinson, who's been a stud for two years now, and then bringing in all these new guys who are talented, the Princeton transfer, the the great freshman. How do you think they will all mesh together, and do you see them competing for a Big Ten title this year? I do see Michigan competing for a Big Ten title because uh, I think Hunter has shown the ability to expand his game every year. And so I think you're going to see him shooting threes. I think you're going to see – Sometimes he'll get the defensive rebound and initiate the fast break. Uh, I you're gonna I think Jawan is gonna let him expand his game. So we're gonna see a much more dynamic Hunter Dickinson this season. I love it because he's one of my favorite players to watch. But I I, I think that Michigan is gonna be a team that's gonna be reckoned with. And when you talk about Terrence Williams, a lot of people don't talk about his impact and the fact that he came in last season a couple games, especially against Tennessee and really solidify what Michigan was trying to do. So um, I think that he's going to be excellent. Jet Howard, uh, Jawan's son, is 6'7", 6'8", two guard. Um, That's going to get a lot of uh, rope and leeway to uh, showcase his skills. Uh, Doug McDaniel, who is a diminutive guard out of the DMV area, the D.C. area, he comes from the ultra-competitive Washington Catholic League, one of the best leagues in the country. So he's going to be able to play. And then you mentioned uh, Jalen Llewellyn, um, who was a top 100 recruit that went to Princeton out of high school. So he was a top 100 recruit. So he could ball before he got to Princeton. And now he's a guy that's a bona fide bucket getter that can run the point, but he he can also slide off ball and really create a lot of offense for you. So uh, Michigan's got some, you know, they've got some options. I was really sad to see Frankie Collins transfer that that one hurt me a little bit because I love his athleticism I thought he was going to be a guy that was going to step in for a bigger role but uh he chose to leave but even with his absence I think Michigan is going to be a team right there at the top as well all right and then the other team in Michigan is Michigan State I I know that their schedule is ridiculous in the the non-conference they got Gonzaga they got Kentucky Villanova Alabama um I Kind of similar to last year where I don't know if they have a, a guy or a stud, but they still they return um, Lee Hall, 
AJ Holgard and uh, Joey Hauser, which is a pretty solid nucleus where I could see um, Tom Izzo kind of working to get the the sum of the parts, you know, to be playing pretty well together. Uh, where, where, where do you see them kind of heading into the season in the Big Ten rankings? I, I Historically, with Michigan State, when they're thought of as middle of the pack, they respond pretty well. And so yeah. I think they're positioned well because they've got – they've got more veterans than most of the returning teams. And when you have veterans, you've been through the battles of the big 10. They've been, they played the best. They play the best schedule in the country every year almost. So uh, that's not going to be a surprise for them. So Walker coming back, Hogart coming back, Joey Hauser. I think um, I expect him to kind of find his footing. He was a guy that was a newcomer of the year preseason when he first got to Michigan State. Yeah. I think the COVID situation really bothered him. It hurt his progress. It stunted his development. Um, I'd like to see if he can get back on track to where a lot of people think that he can go. You referenced Malik Hall, uh, who's a pre preseason uh, all-Big Ten performer. He's a guy that can take over games. Matty Sissoko up front is a big physical um presence that is limited offensively but I don't think they need much out of him I'm really looking forward to seeing Jaden Akins um, a very athletic guard that didn't get a lot of time last year but I think he could be a key for them because he's a type of athlete that can go get his own shot and uh, take a little bit of pressure off some of the other players uh, there but I like Michigan State and I think that with their veterans uh, coming back and Tom Izzo you can never count them out 100 percent 100 percent and i want to move to ohio state next is last season it kind of surprised me um especially if picking up wheeler from penn state that their biggest weakness was on the defensive end um they, they just whatever it was it was just kind of lacking defensively uh this upcoming year they have a duel of tanner holden and Justice Suing at the wings that I don't think enough people are talking about. But at the same time, it kind of goes back to can Ohio State improve their defense to reach that next level and go a little further in the dance? Well, they're going to have a different uh, makeup this season because they've got, mm. I believe, eight new players uh, that have come in. They've got the best recruiting class in the Big Ten and the num number eight recruiting class in the country. So they've done a good job of – filling the pipeline uh, to come into the program and to develop them. I don't anticipate they're, they're very uh, talented group collectively, but I don't see any one of them being one and done type like you see with Jalen Hood Shafino. Um, so I, I think when you look at this group, I see um, in their last exhibition, Isaac Likely, uh, likely, I think is it likely Isaac likely, uh, from Oklahoma State is going to run the point guard position. Um, from uh, he's a big physical six five, about two thirty five. His uh, wingspan is six foot nine, so it allows okay. him to guard wow. threes and fours because he's strong enough to hold guys off in the post. And if you're switching, he's got that wingspan that can really cover up a lot of deficiencies. You've got Sam McNeil, um, who is a who is a three point marksman from West yeah. Virginia. He's hit like 126 threes the last two seasons. And that's something that Ohio State's going to need to be able to stretch the floor. Uh, and, it, you know, if he's at West Virginia, he knows how to play defense. So yeah. he's going he's gonna to sit down and, and defend. Um, I, I like uh, Zed Key up front to start. Um, I also think you mentioned Justice Suing. Um, Tanner Holden uh, averaged 20 points a game last year yeah. for Wright State. And this they, he has two years – of eligibility. So this year and next year. Um, so I, I think that uh, Ohio state will be a little undersized. They've got Akpala Ak up front as a six eleven freshman. Who's going to get some time up front, but you know, he's, he's two fifteen, two twenty. 220. Um, mm. So I don't expect him to be able to hang with the Zach Edies, the Hunter yeah. Dickinson's, you know, the Cliff O'Morier's, o uh, the Trace Jackson Davis's. I don't think physically that he can compete with them on a consistent basis, but you will see him and Chris Holtman will throw him in uh, to get him ready uh, to face the physicality. But um, I think Ohio state is going to be a team that can be pesky in the back end of February, but it's going to take them a long time 
to figure right. out who they are because they've got to depend on so many new faces. All right. So I just want to run through a few more teams. I'm going to ask you who your pick is for uh, the preseason Big Ten champion. So the next team is Penn State. Is It seems like a story with Penn State over, I'll say, yeah, around the last decade or so, is they are another team that is always competing. They compete to the end of the wire. They're always tough. They're gritty. But a lot of times it just can't seal the deal and get that win. You've said that in one of your breakdown videos. And, you know, last time I remember a Penn State team, you know, that was able to close out games was under Taylor Battle. You know, when they won the NIT, when they made the NCAA tournament, lost a heartbreaker to Temple um, on a last-second shot. But do you think this Penn State team has it in them, like that 2010-2011 Penn State team, to seal the deal, to finish off games, and to get some some victories when it's close at the end crunch time? You know, it's going to be hard to say, Matt, because, uh, you know, you lo- when you lose a guy like John Hera up front, yeah. Um, who could physically compete against the Giants of the Big Ten? Uh, he gave them a chance. And so they don't have him. And and when you're trying to you know, overcome a guy that was so defensively sound, and what I mean by that, Hera was so good that he could guard Hunter Dickinson, but he was always one of the first help defenders to help his guys who got broken down off the bounce from the perimeter that were attacking the, the paint area. He was hmm. so good that he could provide help and still get back to Hunter Dickinson and try to keep him off the glass from crashing over the top. Uh, that's hard to replace. And so they're going to have to do it by committee. They're going to be a little under, a little bit undersized, but Micah Shrewsbury is going to have his teams competitive. He, his, his scheming is really good um, offensively, how he gets picket in position to score. Seth Lundy uh, is a capable scorer. And so, um, you know, they're going to have to depend on some guys up front that are less experienced. And it just kind of depends on their development, how well they'll be consistently night in and night out in the Big Ten. Sure. And uh, the next thing I want to talk about is Rutgers. Uh, they they lose, you know, their two studs and Geo Baker and Ron Harper Jr., who seemingly been there forever at this point. But they they still return – a solid nucleus and their principles being extremely physical uh, of just the toughness, tough as nails. I, I don't think they're going to take a huge step back. I think they're still going to be kind of on a similar level as they were last year, despite losing their two score, top scores that they've had for years. What do you think? Yeah. Rutgers has uh, Rutgers is a place now that's built their culture under Steve mm. Peichel. So when you think of culture, you think of Wisconsin, you know what I'm talking about. You think of culture, yeah. and I say Michigan State, you know what I'm talking about. So now Rutgers has ha- has established this culture of toughness, defensive prowess. Of When you come to – it's called Jersey Mike Arena now, but it's the rack. When you go into yeah. the rack, uh, you know that you're, you're in for a battle. So, you know, they've got a trifecta of players that are as good as anybody in the, in the conference. Returning Defensive Player of the Year, Caleb McConnell, 6'7" can guard four or five positions. Paul McKay, six, seven, run the point, can guard four yeah. or five positions. Cliff Amorier was, I believe, second in the country or led the country in dunks last year, uh, just ferocious around the rim, mm-hmm. really good defender. Uh, he's going to be expected to score even more. They brought in a guy named Cam Spencer, um, and he was a 18 points per game score. Uh, I believe from Loyola, Maryland. Um, oh, yeah. So he's a guy that can really uh, stretch the floor a little bit. He can create his own shot. So uh, they're going to be interesting uh, to see if they can maintain that level. They're going to have guys that need to come in. Andre Hyatt is going to have to expand his offensive role. Um, but the guy I mentioned earlier in our telecast, Derek Simpson is a point guard who watch out for him, ladies and gentlemen, uh, He's the most athletic point guard since Corey Sanders. And if anybody remembers Corey Sanders, he was an athletic freak. He could fly. Yes, so this sir. young man, Derek Simpson, is going to be a fan favorite. Uh, is going to be a guy that I think will be one of the better freshmen in the league. Oh, hey. No, I, that, that's interesting. I, I'm, I'm excited to see that now. Um, so the last two teams, I want, I'm going to lump them together because okay. they kind of have a similar story, is Purdue and Wisconsin. 
Uh, both of them lose, you know, top 10 picks. Uh, both of them play very fundamentally sound, good team basketball, good moving offensively. Uh, how do you think each team retools in this upcoming season? I, I think when you look at both of these squads, you're talking about Purdue and Wisconsin, correct? Yeah. Um, they've got the veterans. They've got the culture. Um, Zach Eady's going to lock down up front. And I, I think that they'll be in the mix in terms of top five or top six, both of the teams, because I agree. Chucky Hepburn is steady as you come at point guard. Tyler Wall, I believe, is going to expand his game uh, and be one of the better players. He's preseason all-conference, but I think he'll end first or second team all Big Ten uh, when this when it's all said and done. Crowell is up, has added strength and size. Um, if Jordan Davis can accept his role as a defensive stopper and a opportunistic scorer, I believe that that will go a long way in – uh, what Wisconsin is going to do, but I, I would never count against them because their style of play, limiting the number of possessions, always gives them a chance to be competitive. All right, and there we go. We broke down the majority of the Big Ten teams. Now I got to ask you, who's your pick to win the Big Ten this upcoming season? It's hard to go against Indiana. Um, I would not be surprised to see if Illinois won, but um, for what we see on paper right now and what what has happened in the past. I will stick with the, the pick of Indiana being the preseason favorite, but definitely not surprised to see if Illinois or Michigan or, you know, even a Purdue were a uh, crown champion as well. Okay. And now as, as we wrap this up, I want to focus on some individual players real quickly. Uh, if you had to make a preseason pick for a player of the year, who would it be? Mm, great call. Uh, Terrence Shannon Jr., Illinois. Okay, and do you have any dark horse candidates? Jalen Hood, Shafino, Indiana. Okay, I, I want to give you mine because I, I, I think he can be the real deal. And this is a homer pick because I, I'm a Wisconsin guy. But Tyler Wall is somebody who I think will surprise people how good he is at basketball. Because last season he was behind two alphas and Brad Davis and Johnny Davis. Now it's his time to be – the guy he's the big man on campus he's a senior and you know he had that really slow start from three-point land last season where he started off something around 0 for 20 to start but then the last few months of the season he finished 6 of 18 in the last 17 games which is 30 percent which at the very least is respectable where a team just can't leave you wide open to shoot that three now the biggest thing for wall is have he shot, he shot well in France on their tour from three. And then the red-white scrimmage, the Wisconsin red-white scrimmage, I think he hit three threes, including a jab step three. Um, he's just He just looked like he knows he's the guy. Like that mindset kind of shifted where he's got the extra swagger to him this year. If Wall can be respectable from three-point land, I'm talking north of 30%, all of a sudden he's an athletic six-foot-nine guy. All of a sudden that opens up the drive. Because not, he hasn't had a lot of opportunities to drive because teams just sag off of him. So if he can be respectable from three-point land, I think Tyler Wall is somebody to watch out for as a dark horse candidate to win Big Ten Player of the Year. Okay, now who's your other one? Uh, th- th- that's that's my biggest one. I would, I would say my other one would be uh, it's, it's who's my prediction to win or who's my other dark horse candidate? Uh, both. Okay, I would say oof, my prediction to be – Big Ten Player of the Year. I, I, I'm going to stay with Tyler Wall for the Dark Horse. Okay. And I, I'll give it to Hunter Dickinson as my preseason Big Ten Player of the Year. That's a good choice. Who do, who yeah. do you like to win the league? What was that? Who do you like to win the league? Who do I like to win the league? Um, I – now I'm going to be Homer again. Don't count out Wisconsin to finish in the top four. I don't know if I'm going to push them all the way to the to the champs, but you, you've kind of made a compelling case for Indiana with you know the returning talent. With I, I always like that combination of having seasoned talent and then that those young studs mix in there. So I, I'll rock with. I think I'll rock with Indiana. My mind has kind of shifted in this 45 minutes that we talked. So okay. sounds good. So, I'll go with Indiana. Okay. So um, one other thing 
I want to talk about is you also made a video regarding uh, Juwan Howard, Greg Gard. And I know you don't want to talk about it because you have relationships with both parties. You took the very professional, mature route. But I'm just speaking from a fan. All right, I just want to share my perspective with you. I hope there's – not between those two, but I hope the fans and the players have a little extra juice. And here's why. I want Wisconsin to have a legit rival because I don't feel like they have one right now. Like if I ask you who, who's Wisconsin rival, who do you say? Mm, Iowa or, Mich- or Minnesota. Yeah, but it's it's not it's not like clear cut because the Minnesota has been pretty one sided for so many years now. True, That's and true. and Iowa, I don't think anybody outside of diehard Big Ten fans knows there's any there's anything there. So I I just. For entertainment purposes, I would find it entertaining if there's a little juice. And I think you got to follow that storyline. Um, and I think the biggest thing, I think it would have died off had Hunter Dickinson not come back. Because I don't know if you remember, but in the, the the presser after Wisconsin lost in the round of 32 and Michigan made the Sweet 16, Dickinson had a few words to say about uh, Badger fans and uh, the Badgers saying, oh, those guys from Madison, those fans had some things to say, but they're not playing anymore. <laughs> so I, I think that game, that is one I have circled on my calendar. I'm fired up for. Do you think, you think you know, maybe the coaches bury the hatchet, but do you think there's a potential for a rivalry between the schools, Michigan and Wisconsin, going forward? Well, I think there's been a natural rivalry because, uh, you know, of the, the games that they've played in the past. You remember Ben Brust, half-court runner yeah. off the glass. I mean – they, they've had epic battles in the past, and I think that that's what elevates those games because the players, trust me, Matt, they're not thinking about last year. They don't care about Jawan and Greg's, uh, you know, dust up and Joe Kravenhoff, you know, getting hit. They don't care about that stuff. They just – they know that it's going to be a quality opponent. You got to strap it up like you do every night in the Big Ten, and I know it sounds cliche, but when you watch the, the league night in and night out, man, it's a grind. And these guys, it, the the best teams learn, they don't get up more for Michigan than they do for Rutgers. Because if you get up more for one, okay, you win that game. But when you let down, yeah, no matter who you play in this conference, you're going to get beaten. So, um, you know, it, Hunter, I, I, the Hunter is great for the league. He's great for the league because you 100%. don't see players talking to fan bases. He, the Illinois fan base, hates Hunter Dickinson. But it's great for the league. It makes it so, fun. Yeah. So, you know, I, I love him. And I love the fact that he's a big guy that has personality. Because a lot of times those guys are kind of <laughs> quiet into themselves. But he's he's the opposite of that. And I want to revisit one topic we talked about earlier is the Big Ten struggles. And there there's a theory out there. The Big Ten struggles in the NCAA tournament, to clarify. Um, and there's a theory out there. I just want your feedback on this. Um I, I've heard people say, okay, the Big Ten is so physical, night in and night out. You have teams pounding at each other, beating each other down, where they're worn out come tournament time, and they play a style of basketball that um, is different than other conferences. So if they have some refs from the Pac-12 coming in to ref their NCAA tournament games and they're playing that physical Big Ten basketball, they end up in uh, you know some foul trouble, some bad situations. Do you think there's anything to that thought process that the Big Ten is almost too physical for its own good and that might cause some problems in the NCAA tournament? No, Matt, I, I think those are narratives that have been talked about for years, but I don't I don't think they apply anymore because um, here's the thing. If the Big Ten was playing too physically and too much, you, you wouldn't have four wing players that were first-round draft picks, yeah. right? The league gets all of this coverage because these mammoth guys, Kofi Coburn, Zach Eady, Hunter Dickinson, you know, they're roaming the Big Ten, right? And uh, Luca Garza, um, you know, guys from recent memory, 6'10", 6'11", and above. But uh, the league scores as well as anybody in the country. In the country. Uh, there's teams that are the high, highest scoring among the other Power Five conferences teams in the country. Um, excuse me, I mentioned the athletes and the level of athletes now that are in the Big Ten, that are allowing the Big Ten to play better and more up-tempo. They're just getting beat in crucial games in the Big Ten tournament, uh, in the NCAA tournament here in the last few games, a few mm-hmm. years. 
Uh, that's they've got to overcome that. That's got to be preparation. That's got to be game time coaching. They've got to be better. And the players have to be better in, in crunch time situations because we've seen teams that have not played up to their potential get upset in the first or second yeah. round of the NCAA tournament. So it's on the programs. It's on the players, it's on the coaches. Everybody has to do a little bit better. And if they do, I think we'll see a different outcome. All right. And talking about those three top 10 picks this last year, one last time, um, who do you think is going to have the best NBA career out of Jaden Ivey, Keegan Murray, and Johnny Davis? Too way too early to tell because you don't you you won't know the fit of the team that they got drafted to uh, at that level for ooh 30, 40 games. You'll start to get a sense of of where they fit within their particular franchises and how they you know who they're playing with. How are they comfortable? Are they struggling? You know, it's hmm. it's it's so early to tell, but I, I think that. Uh, if you look at the summer league situation, Keegan Murray really balled out in the summer. Uh, yeah. And so he seems to be very comfortable among this with the Sacramento Kings. For me, Keegan Murray's my pick to be the best one just because okay. of that length. And he always, he's just so level headed. He never gets sped up. He can score so naturally. I just see him being a great NBA player. Uh, the only problem is he's in Sacramento and Sacramento, Sacramento, this is their history in recent years just hasn't been great. So I hope he can bring a winning culture to Sacramento and hopefully score 20 points per game, but do so on winning teams. So uh, the, the one other question I have for you regarding players who went pro this past year is Kofi Coburn. Um, are you surprised that he did not sign with the NBA team, you know, and to the regular season roster? And where do you think he would have been drafted, say, 15 years ago? No, I'm not surprised he wasn't drafted. Uh, you know, the, the NBA game is so different now, and it's not that he can't play at that level. It's just that he's got to he's got to go and work on some things uh, that would allow him to be better at that level. So he's in Japan. I believe he's in Japan right now. So mm. Japan, he's going to make a lot of money. Um, he's not going to have a ton of wear and tear on his body. I hope that he can get with someone that can really help him develop his footwork, develop his uh, ability to step outside the, the floor, set screens, pick and pop, uh, you know, make plays with the ball out on the uh, on the floor, space the floor. I hope he can work on those things. Or if he wants to continue to dominate and stay in Japan, because I play my last four years there. It's a very lucrative league. It's not mm. hard. It's not hard to play in. Um, you know, if he wants to do that and he finds uh, some comfort level there, I wish him the best. But um, you know, it'd be interesting to see what happens with him, but he's a, he's a highly intelligent young man. And I know that, uh, he'll make the best decision for him. Sure. And do you think if, you know, about 15 years ago, if the year is 2007, do you think he's drafted? Oh, he's a first round pick. He'd be a lottery pick, uh, oh, with right. his size and speed and the way that the, the league was still working inside out as opposed to outside in. Uh, oh, right. yeah, he, he would be a lottery pick. I, I believe. All right, and then the last question I have for you before we go to the rapid-fire round is what are your thoughts about UCLA and USC joining the Big Ten? Oh, I love it. I mean, you know, you're you're not going to stop college expansion, and so if you're a conference like the Big Ten and you want to remain uh, elite and you want to compete because, let's face it, it's coming down to an arms race between the Big Ten and the SEC, and with Oklahoma and Texas going to the SEC, which many thought Texas was a much better fit for the big 10, but geographically chose to go to the sec. When you get schools like UCLA and USC, you get the Los Angeles market. You get the number two market in the country. Yeah, that's true. I mean, in this thing, what people don't realize it's not about, it's not about football powers. It's about television markets. Yeah. And so the next two places to look is Atlanta and Miami where Georgia tech and Miami go. That's where you want to, that's where you want to look to see the next level of expansion because those are the, the last remaining uh, television markets that haven't been locked up. Yeah. It, it's, it's a, it's a new age. It's a new, it's a lot different than it was a few years ago, you know, just being solely Midwest team. So uh, yeah, Steven, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I, I just have one last round for you. It's a rapid fire round uh, where I'm going to ask you a plethora of questions and just respond in a timely fashion. Okay. All right. So the first uh, first question I have for you is, who had the best home court advantage in the Big Ten when you were playing? 
Iowa. Who has the best home court advantage now? Purdue. I agree with that 100%. Toughest individual matchup you've ever had? Uh, uh, Chris Moore's from Auburn. Boy, I think this next one's going to be tough. But who's the favorite individual team you've ever covered as an analyst? 2005, Illinois, Illinois squad. Oh, hey. Yeah. Favorite player you've ever covered as an analyst? Oh, favorite player. Wow. Yeah. Um, I've covered Harden. I've covered Giannis. Um, maybe Giannis. All right. Uh, who was your favorite player growing up? Dr. J. Julius Irving. M- MJ or LeBron? LeBron. Oh, that surprises me. That surprises me. I know you kind of lead towards, uh, you know, the, the, the older generation for some other things. Why LeBron over MJ, if you don't mind me asking? He's the most athletic forward point forward we've ever seen in the NBA. He's the size of Carl Malone with uh, point guard skills. Um, can score. He, he's he's second all time leading scorer in NBA history. Um, he's taken three rookie coaches to the NBA Finals. Uh, he's had the number of a co play co teammates that he's played with compared to what Jordan played with. Um, I think if people will go back and look at that, they would see that LeBron has really uh, done a great job of making players better. And so, um, you know, I, I, I reluctant cause I love Jordan. I, I, I know him personally. I love him. Um, uh, but if the, the greatest of all time, when he's finished playing will be LeBron James. Okay. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Favorite, favorite holiday? Thanksgiving. Favorite food? Uh, seafood pasta. And favorite movie? Ooh. Ooh. Favorite movie. I was going to say Shawshank Redemption. That's one of my favorites. I'll go with Oy. that. Oh, hey, sounds great. Well, Stephen, thank you very much for coming on the show. I had a blast talking with you. Uh, Yeah, best of luck and enjoy this upcoming season covering the Big Ten. Thanks so much for having me, Matt. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you for watching the video. And if you enjoyed that, make sure to subscribe for more Big Ten content and listen to Sports Chat Matt wherever you get your podcasts.